Let me see a show of hands. How many of you believe that modern slavery has affected your life in any way? Interesting. Have you ever wondered if our definition of modern slavery can be more inclusive or even more complete? Well, I come from a country where thousands of humans are enslaved, mainly in rural and marginalized societies where the law, religion, and families justify the unspeakable abuse that these slaves endure every day. Yet, they are not included in this definition. Why? Because in Iraq, we don't call them slaves. We call them wives. Amira is one of them. She was 17 years old when her father and brothers forced her to drop out of school to marry a man she'd never met. At first, she innocently thought that marrying this stranger might bring a better and a more liberating life after enduring endless conflict, poverty, and terrorism in her hometown of Mosul. But Abid was only marrying Amira to entertain him and be an unpaid housewife for his family. I remember Amira shaking when she said, I was beaten on my first night of the wedding and was verbally, physically, and psychologically tortured for two decades after. After giving birth to her first child, she said, I was humiliated and punched repeatedly every time I asked him to buy milk or diapers. I was called a slut and denied treatment when I begged to go to the hospital for medical care. When she had three other children, she tried to find a job so that she herself could feed them. But she said, he clipped my wings and never let me. In Iraq, this is the future of girls. This is the future of girls growing up in a culture that grants men the right to own and discipline women. An Iraqi girl stands a 46% chance of being a domestic violence victim. She can be used to pay a debt, negotiate a truce, or simply for entertainment. In 2015, for example, one tribe resolved a dispute by giving away 50 women in compensation. And if she's brave enough to say no, she might end up one of the 14,000 mothers and daughters murdered in the name of honor by their own families since 2003. Growing up, in a remote and conflict-affected town in Iraq myself, my childhood was haunted by the sight and sounds of men abusing their wives and children everywhere in my community, the media, and even family. As no nonprofit ever made enough efforts to reach my town and educate people on this enslavement mindset, there were absolutely no medical, legal, or psychological services nor shelter programs that are responsive to victims' cries for help. So I founded a humanitarian organization in 2017 called Youth for Women Foundation to fill that gap. We've proudly impacted more than 4.5 thousand women and children in 49 underserved communities of three countries so far. Through educational trainings on gender equality and digital health to a community-wide research program surveying 1,100 women and girls in 720 households of rural Iraq. We found a massive acceleration in domestic violence during COVID and a shocking community ignorance about any policy or resources. Thus, we launched a national campaign that inspiringly mobilized over 600 diverse youth, government, and religious leaders civil society organizations and rural women as lifelong activists and messengers for the endorsement of a nationwide domestic violence policy. (laughs) 
So why am I, a Middle Eastern man here, talking about women's struggles? Well, my biggest aspiration is to see more men taking action on this epidemic. We men must be at the forefront of rebuilding the system that silently enslaves women. Let's together wake society up from this deeply rooted illusion that women are owned by men, from taking away women's body autonomy in Texas to the enslavement of women and girls in Iraq and Afghanistan. We owe it to Amira, her children, and our own mothers and daughters. I would always proudly say that I'm not a man unless I'm a feminist. Thank you.